Hello, welcome. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Iga Stasiak, the Provincial Wildlife Health Specialist with the Ministry of Environment, will be speaking about chronic wasting disease in Saskatchewan, a wildlife management challenge. Before we begin, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous people in Canada today. Just a few items before we get going, I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. And our next Native Prairie Speaker Series is on May 3rd about Golden Eagles by Dr. Joe Schmutz. And he's recently retired from the University of Saskatchewan. And you can register for this webinar through the PCAP website. Our webinars are recorded and are available on the PCAP YouTube channel. And that's www.youtube.com slash user slash skpcap. And a reminder to our listeners out there, um, if you have any questions, just type it into the question section or Q&A section on the webinar dashboard and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. Um, if you're one of our regular attendees, you may have noticed we're now on Zoom instead of GoToWebinar, so uh, feel free to let us know how you like it. Um, I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrien, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SASTAL. And in-kind support has been provided by the Government of Saskatchewan, the Ministry of Environment. Um, so without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Iga Stasiak is a wildlife health specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. She obtained her veterinary degree on the from the Ontario Veterinary College in Canada in 2007, and after a stint in private practice, she completed her Doctor of Veterinary Science degree in Zoological Medicine and Pathology at the University of Guelph and Toronto Zoo before pursuing her career as a wildlife veterinarian. Prior to joining the Ministry of Environment in 2018, she worked as a wildlife veterinarian in the Northwest Territories and in Kentucky. So with that, I'll pass it over. All right. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you to PHAC for uh, sponsoring this talk today and, and the opportunity. Um, so I can't see everyone, but uh, we'll leave, have some questions and opportunity for some discussions at the end of the webinar. So I'll just share my screen here. Um, one second. No, I can't find my little mouse. <laughs> there we go. One second here. We'll get it going. All right. So, as Caitlin mentioned, I'm a wildlife health specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. I've been in this position for the last five years. Um, previously, I worked in Kentucky. Um, I I worked uh, there uh, where we did not have chronic wasting disease yet uh, in anticipation of its introduction. And um, when I moved up to Saskatchewan, I knew I was coming to a province where CWD uh, was a major management issue and had been for 20 years at the time. So now we're going on 25 years. Um, so today I'm going to give you a little bit of background information and overview of CWD in Saskatchewan um, and discuss some of the challenges that we're facing here in the province. There we go. So uh, what is chronic wasting disease? Uh, so chronic wasting disease is an infectious neurological disease that affects members of the deer family. So here in Saskatchewan, that's white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Uh, the disease has not yet been detected in caribou, um, but it is, uh, it is a risk to them. Uh, they are known to be susceptible as well. So this disease is, is highly unusual in that it's not caused by typical virus or bacteria. It's caused by an infectious protein called a prion. And it's basically a misfolded version of a protein that we all have uh, that's present in mammalian species. And it's a normally occurring protein. What happens is it's abnormally uh, folded and becomes infectious, uh, in turn affecting other proteins in the body, essentially leading to degeneration of brain tissue uh, and dementia-like illness. So the animals tend to waste away of the disease. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is no treatment or cure. There's no vaccine for this disease. Um, it's always fatal. Uh, and animals you know, will succumb to the infection typically within two years in deer. So um, it is a, a significant concern uh, just in that uh, the nature of the disease itself. Uh, now, this disease is a uh, prion disease and it is related to other prion diseases that you may be familiar with like uh, BSC or mad cow disease. Now, if you remember, BSC uh, caused a big stir in the early 90s in the UK. Uh, it was a disease of cattle that was related to feeding uh, ruminant uh, meat and bone meal, so cattle parts back to cattle, uh, and caused a similar type of, of neurodegenerative disease in cattle. Uh, and a few years later, it was actually found to be transmissible to people, and there were a few cases infected with, with uh, mad cow disease. Uh, and so for that reason, there is concern and has been concern about the nature of prion diseases and potential for transmission. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, as far as transmission to other species. Um, but as far as we know, CWD is a disease of, of members of the deer family or the cervid family. Uh, there's other naturally occurring diseases and people call creutzfeldt jakob disease as a human version or of a prion disease. And sheep scrapie has been around for over 400 years and is a, is a different type of prion disease that's been around in sheep. So. Okay, um, so what do animals with CWD look like? So uh, we really don't see any clinical signs or symptoms until the very end stages of this disease. Uh, so typically in the last few weeks or months of infection, you're going to see animals that are emaciated. Uh, so loss of body condition, hence the wasting in the name. Uh, loss of coordination, changes in behavior as it's a neurological disease. Uh, you're going to see um, excessive drinking, urination. Um, there's a picture here of an elk from a captive facility in Wyoming with CWD. You can see the sort of sawhorse uh, sort of abnormal stance, uh, droopy head, droopy ears, uh, salivation, and animals generally in really poor condition. So typically in deer, animals will die of the infection within two years. It is also dependent a bit on the individual animal genetics. So some animals can take a little bit longer before they succumb to infection. And in elk, it's typically um, a bit longer, so typically three years on average before animals die of the disease. So if you're out on the prairies and you're a hunter, uh, you probably want to know if, if the animal's infected. And, and you'd ask yourself this question, you know, looking at this picture, if this animal is sick. Well, um, you know, this animal looks perfectly healthy. It's in great body condition. Uh, unfortunately, we can't tell if this animal has chronic wasting disease. Um, it may be subclinical or in the early stage of the disease uh, and animals can be infected and can actually be shedding the infection. So they shed infection in their urine, feces and saliva, uh, and they can do that before they show any signs of illness. So, so we can't tell just by looking at them. So this brings us to the transmission. So how is this disease spread? Uh, and it's through two main ways. Uh, one is direct contact, so between animals. So I mentioned it's shed in the urine, feces, and saliva, so in the bodily fluids. So when animals are in close contact, there's opportunity through grooming, um, so contact with saliva. Uh, maybe when they shed their ant antlers in late winter, they can be licking the pedicles, and there's some bloody uh, blood there. Um, so there's opportunities that they can be infected through um, contact with each other. And the other source of transmission is indirect or environmental sources. Uh, so this could be things like you know, just licking the soil or minerals, if minerals are being put out, uh, sometimes for hunting purposes, uh, any sort of feed sources, bait uh, that's that's out there or environmental sources. Um, so that is that is believed to be uh, another significant source of transmission, particularly in areas where the disease has been around for a long time. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit, but here in Saskatchewan, uh, CWD has been around for, for quite a long time. So uh, we expect there is um, much environmental contamination in some areas. So likely uh, when the disease is first introduced or new to an area, you're gonna have more transmission through that direct animal to animal contact. And as the disease um, you know, becomes more prevalent in the population, you're gonna start having more of this environmental contamination. Um, so in terms of environmental sources, there's been a number of studies of different potential sources of, of CWD infection. 
Uh, and this is largely from endemic areas in other parts of, uh, of North America. Uh, so there's been studies uh, for, of water sources, for instance, in Colorado, uh, which is um, where the disease originated, was first detected uh, in a research facility. Um, mineral licks in Wisconsin, where there's uh, CWD endemic and white-tailed deer populations. There's also been some studies in soil as well. Uh, and what those studies have found is that certain types of soils uh, tend to bind uh, these prions or infectious proteins uh, and can actually make the soil more infectious. Uh, and these include clay soils. And clay soils, uh, as you may know, are very uh, common uh, across the prairies. Uh, so in southern Saskatchewan and particularly in the South Saskatchewan River Valley, which is one of the areas where we have really high rates of CWD in our wildlife populations. So, so the clay composition is really important as well. And, and, and there has been studies looking at that. Uh, we don't know how that might differ, for instance, in the boreal forest where we have different types of soil. Uh, what we do know is that prions can persist in the environment for years to decades. Uh, and I say that with a bit of a question mark because we don't know for sure. Uh, we know it's at least a few years, um, but uh, the sheep scrapie agent, which is another prion disease, was found to persist in the environment for 16 years. Um, so much, much longer. So, so it's possible it could be, uh, could be decades. Um, there's also the question of whether prions can be taken up by plants, uh, and there are now a number of studies that have shown that to be the case. Uh, so there is a, a photo here from a study in 2015 that uh, looked at the uptake of CWD in wheatgrass, and they incubated both uh, the leaves and the stems of the plant uh, with CWD prions. They also planted the plant in infected soil. Uh, that was infected with brain material from infected deer. And what they found was that the prions were present both on the surface of the plant, but also were also taken up in the roots, uh, in the roots of the plant as well into the stems. So, uh, so there was some evidence that CWD prions can be taken up into plants. Uh, there have been some studies now in alfalfa, tomatoes, and corn, and a few other, other species of plants. Um, and those studies were done by the, in the United States by the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, as far as how significant this is as a mode of transmission, whether or not animals, such as deer, can become infected uh, by eating infected plants, um, we don't know that yet. So that's, that's, uh, that's still a question mark. Um, likely it would be, you know, we presume it would be a very low uh, contributor to transmission, but just certainly something that um, that's interesting uh, to look at and look into. So a bit of history background, I didn't, uh, didn't go over this yet, um, but a question on everybody's mind is where did this disease come from? So the first cases of CWD uh, were found in a captive research facility of mule deer in Colorado in 1967. Um, these animals exhibit a similar wasting syndrome, but it was not known that this was uh, actually CWD. Uh, CWD was not characterized until um, late 70s, early 80s. So it was not known what was causing the syndrome at the time, but, uh, but this was the area of first detection. And after this initial detection, uh, so this, so first of all, how did it get there? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, this particular facility also had sheep on it that were infected with sheep scrapie. So the other prion disease of sheep, uh, it's called scrapie because it causes neurologic disease in sheep and also causes them to sort of itch or scratch and, and uh, kind of rub against fences. So it's called scrapie. Um, so one of the theories is that potentially CWD uh, evolved from the sheep scrapie agent at the same facility. It's possible it also arose spontaneously um, and it was a new sort of novel mutation or evolution of this protein in deer. Um, so we don't really know for certain, but that seems to be where it originated. Uh, and, and subsequently, the disease was found in um, mule deer and elk uh, in the vicinity in Colorado uh, and neighboring Wyoming. So you can see here on this map, this is fast forward to 1996. Um, so the gray areas are areas where the disease is present in, um, in wildlife. So here in wild uh, mule deer and elk populations. Uh, and 1996 uh, was the actually the year that we first detected the disease in Saskatchewan. Uh, so the disease was detected in farmed elk, 
that had been imported from South Dakota in the late 1980s. So um, it was the 1980s when the game farming industry was established in the province uh, with the goal of diversifying the agricultural economy. So it was also around the same time that wild boar farming was established in the province. Uh, and so there was markets for meat and velvet from elk, uh, also uh, hunting industry uh, of deer that was a smaller component of the, the industry. Um, so these farmed animals, uh, through import records, we know they had come from a far the farm in South Dakota that was later found to be CWD infected. And so a few years later, uh, there were a couple additional farms that were found positive. There was a farm in Swift Current uh, area in 1998, also an elk farm. And these farms were traced back to a farm in Lloyd Minister that had, so this was in 2000 now. Uh, so fast forward a, a few years, uh, and those farms were traced back to a farm in Lloyd Minister that uh, had, you know, had imported the original animals and had actually shipped animals out to addition, over 30 additional bar game farms in Saskatchewan. Um, so there were uh, trace outs of CWD positive animals moving to over 30 additional farms in the province uh, in those early years. So uh, immediately after that first detection, 1996, uh, the province uh, started monitoring for CWD in wildlife populations. Uh, and, and at the time, the goals were to detect the distribution of the disease, to estimate the prevalence or the infection rate in the wild, to see if it was established or if it, it had spilled over uh, from, the, from the game farming, uh, the infected game farms. So our first detection in wild uh, deer, those so wild mule deer in Saskatchewan, was in, in the Manitou Sandhills region in uh, 2000. So a few years later, so the same year that we traced back to that farm in Lloyd Minister, uh, there was a wildlife detection uh, in, in that area here circled in reds just south of Lloyd Minister. Um, the government undertook some uh, at the time, aggressive uh, eradication efforts. So there was goals of herd, reducing the herd um, and trying to eliminate this disease from the wild. And the hope at the time was that this was a you know, single incident and there weren't any additional detections. Um, and so there were, was some targeted calling uh, and some liberal hunting opportunities around these areas within a 10 kilometer radius uh, that were being implemented. Unfortunately, a few years later, uh, there were additional detections. Uh, so a bit north of Lloyd Minister here, uh, this is zone 68 in white-tailed deer, as well as along South Saskatchewan River Valley here, you can see there were multiple detections, uh, mostly mule deer and a single white-tailed deer uh, in 2002. So these herd reduction areas or targeted uh, calling areas were expanded around these, uh, these locations. Um, and, you know, at the time, the goal was to reduce the herd by at least 60% or similar to what we'd see with, with a harsh winter. Uh, and the hope and belief still was that it was an isolated disease and that these were just initial, you know, single one-off uh, incidents and it was fairly localized um, and hadn't spread. So we continued monitoring uh, through voluntary hunter submissions. So this includes, uh, so basically involves hunters submitting heads of harvested animals uh, to our surveillance program. And I'll talk about some of the incentives that were put out, but uh, there was uh, a few different programs, including Earn a Buck, uh, which was initiated in 2004 uh, around these areas of positive detection. Uh, and basically what that consisted of was if you harvested uh, two does, uh, and submitted them for testing, you would receive a free uh, buck license. And so that was a big incentive for hunters. Um, and it was unlimited. So if you harvest an additional two does, you can get an additional buck license. Over the years, there was some pushback uh, and, and that was gradually restricted. There was concerns about decimating the deer populations uh, and, and impacts um, yeah, in reducing, you know, I guess a lot of speculation whether or not it would be effective in the first place. Um, although it was quite effective in both limiting the population and getting, getting good sample size numbers for testing. So you can see the gray areas are, are expanding here and I'll just kind of scroll through here. Uh, the yellow dots here on these maps are the infected game farms. Uh, the gray areas are the, um, the areas in the wild. 
So by 2008, uh, you can see the herd, we, we were confident the herd reduction targets were not being met. The disease continued to spread in the province into new areas. Uh, we saw the rate of infection continue to increase, although it was still quite low uh, at the time. Uh, and so the conclusion was that eradication was not successful. Uh, and, and we were not going to be able to eliminate this, this disease um, with more of a focus then on control measures. So I'll just, and this is a map of North America, so you can kind of see the spread, uh, spread across North America, clearly spreading outside of those core areas in the states, outside of Colorado and Wyoming, but also looking at the map here, uh, you can see spread into eastern Alberta as well uh, and across southern Saskatchewan. So uh, 2018, uh, you can see um, that was the year I started with the ministry and things were looking quite a lot worse than they had in the previous decade. So at this point, we recognized that CWD was probably present or endemic across all of southern Saskatchewan um, in the prairies um, and some of the areas where it had not been detected. You can see there's there's a few gray uh, squares missing there along eastern uh, the Manitoba border. Um, however, we had poor, poor monitoring and surveillance in that area, so it was likely present, just not detected or at a low level. So this brings us to where we are today. Uh, and you can see CWD is now established across it in Saskatchewan. Uh, we do have a number of infected operational game farms in the province, which are, which are highlighted in, in red. Uh, and, and you can see the extensive similar uh, spread uh, into uh, eastern Alberta and, and it movement into western Alberta as well. So why is this significant? So this kind of takes us to the why. Why are we talking about this? Why is this a significant disease? Well, it's significant for two reasons. Uh, so we know this is, has a disease that, ha that has the potential to impact wildlife populations. And there's also concerns about the impacts to people. Um, so both direct and indirect. And we'll talk about that. So first and foremost, uh, as for wildlife managers, we're concerned about the impact to our wildlife populations. Uh, we have a number of major uh, big game species or ungulate species here in the province. So I mentioned mule deer, uh, white-tailed deer, elk, moose, and caribou. So uh, there were a number of studies in Colorado and Wyoming in these core areas where the disease had been around for over 30 years. And in the early 2000s, there were studies that were set up to monitor the impacts on these populations. Um, and the results of these studies have shown that the disease uh, does reduce survival uh, of these animals uh, and it impacts population growth. In white-tailed deer, uh, they were able to show that animals that were infected were four and a half times as likely to die annually than animals that were not infected. And they saw a 10% annual population decline. Similar results in mule deer in the same area in a core area of Wyoming, uh, where they saw actually a 50% population reduction during the study period. They found that uh, infected animals were three times as likely to die on an annual basis, and they saw a 21% annual population decline. Uh, and the researchers have concluded that at these current uh, at the current harvest rates, these populations would not be sustainable. So. So there were there was some data. Um, this is this is in around published around 2010 that was already demonstrating that uh, we're seeing, you know, that that this is a population limiting disease. Um, there was also uh, similar studies in elk that showed that at much lower, uh, sorry, lower prevalence rates, around 13 percent, uh, they're seeing decreased population growth rates, which can also be limiting. So, of course, this is cause of concern uh, for Saskatchewan, given the rates we're seeing in the province were exceeding those that were present at the time these studies were conducted in Colorado and Wyoming. So we'll get to we'll get back to Saskatchewan and the situation, uh, the current situation. Um, but in terms of the monitoring, I just wanted to, to kind of quickly go over our CWD monitoring or surveillance program. So I mentioned that it was initiated in 1997. Uh, in, involved voluntary testing, so it's never mandatory um, for hunters to submit animals. We have uh, continued that program. There was a bit of a gap. Uh, so between 2010 and 2016, there were very few samples collected. Uh, there was a bit of 
reluctance, I suppose, after the first decades, uh, a, a bit of misunderstanding perhaps, and not, no appreciation that, uh, that this disease could actually impact wildlife populations because we had not seen those impacts yet. So of course, uh, you know, until you see it yourself, it's, it's really difficult to understand. Um, so, um, but we have, we have continued this, the surveillance program. So currently there are 13 ministry field offices and 19 self-serve drop-off locations where hunters can go uh, from September through January through the hunting season and, and drop off heads from their harvested animals. They can also collect the brain tissues and uh, lymph nodes from the head themselves, submit those from testing, and they actually do get a tracking number so we can uh, check your results online. And it usually takes four to six weeks to get those results back. Um, so in terms of the numbers, so those first few years before it was detected in the wild, uh, we only had 300, just over 300 samples tested. After that first detection, I mentioned there was a lot of red Senate programs like the, um, the herd reduction programs, the calling, and then in 2004, the Ernabuck program was initiated. And so during those years, we received a lot of submissions. So well over a thousand up to 4,000 4, plus samples collected each year. And so we have pretty good data in terms of where the CWD infection rates were uh, during that decade. And that first decade, they remained quite low within less than 5%. Uh, and then unfortunately, there was a big gap in monitoring. Uh, and so fewer than 1,000 samples tested between 2010 and 2017, and that was province-wide. Uh, we picked up again with uh, increased um, you know, uh, communication uh, and, and trying to encourage hunters to submit samples from 2018. And since then, uh, there have been increased submissions. So we've been receiving between 2,000 and 3,000 animals each year. Uh, as you can see, the representation is a little bit biased. Uh, in the map, you can see where the samples are coming from. A lot of them are coming from sort of the southern, southwestern portions of the province where infection rates are really high. Uh, so hunters are wanting to know if their animals are infected. Uh, we have fewer submissions in eastern Saskatchewan and moved to the boreal transition zone. So of course, uh, in future years, we'll be looking to augment our testing and looking to incentivize testing in certain areas of the province so that we can get a better sample size and better understanding of what's happening. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of an overview of the, the overall numbers, which is perhaps less helpful than, uh, than the maps that I'm gonna show next. Um, but overall, in the last few years, 20% of all the cervids uh, animals submitted for testing have tested positive. And if you look at the breakdown by species, uh, we see the highest rates in the province in our mule deer population. So 38% overall, uh, about 14% of our white-tailed deer and about 3% of our moose and elk in the province. Now, um, that's... That's significant in that, you know, we know that mule deer are, um, you know, the, the, the species that is most perhaps susceptible or has the highest rates of transmission. Um, so we see the highest rates in our mule deer, um, but that of course doesn't vary regionally across the province, right? So it's important to look at it uh, at a much finer geographic scale to see where that differs. So I wanted to show these maps here that sort of illustrate where we have some of our highest rates. Uh, and, and where rates are, are generally lower, and also where our data is lacking. Um, so on the left, you see a map of male mule deer, uh, which is the highest infected demographic. Uh, so what's significant is that currently in Saskatchewan, the rates of CWD in our mule deer populations are amongst the highest, if not the highest, anywhere globally. Uh, so currently almost 90%, so it's estimated 80%, anywhere between 70 and 90% of our male mule deer in South Saskatchewan River Valley are infected. Uh, and 52% of our females, so about half of our females uh, in the same region. And that's significant, uh, especially when you're talking about the female segment of the population, uh, and that's gonna cause a decreased recruitment into the population and cause more significant population decline. So, um, so this is, these are the high, some of the highest rates anywhere. And at these rates, we would expect population level impacts. And in fact, we are starting to see population level impacts uh, in this region, particularly the region in red. So the area in red is where infection rates in male mule deer in this case are over 50%. Uh, and then uh, gradually we have uh, orange, which is between 30 and 50%, yellow, 
between 11 and 30 percent and uh, green less than 10 percent. So in this area in red, uh, we are seeing evidence of population decline. Uh, we've been hearing reports anecdotally from hunters for many years that they're seeing uh, fewer older bucks, they're seeing fewer animals on the landscape. Uh, so we have, you know, we've had that information. We've we've been able to to demonstrate that through some of the the surveys, the population surveys recently that have been taking place. So. Um, so that's fairly significant. Uh, as far as white-tailed deer, uh, the rates we're seeing are a little bit lower than what we're seeing in our mule deer. And you can look at the distribution. It's actually fairly similar. So our highest rates are sort of in the central uh, western regions of the province. And as you move further east towards the Manitoba border and up into the boil forest, rates appear to be, um, be a bit lower. And so, uh, so it's kind of interesting, important to kind of look at it on a scale and, and see what's happening here. But um, the important thing is the trajectory of the disease, right? The increasing rates and the fact that in that first decades, we had rates, I mentioned less than 5%. And now in the last six, seven years, we've seen a tenfold increase in infection rates in some areas of the province. And certainly we want to prevent that in some of these areas. Um, into the most eastern and, and, and northern portions of the province. So that we're not, you know, going to have the same population level impacts that we've seen in South Saskatchewan River Valley. Um, the other species that I just wanted to mention here uh, are caribou. So we have not yet detected CWD in caribou, but we know they are a susceptible species. And as you may know, um, boiled caribou are federally listed species. So they're threatened species under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, and so they're facing numerous threats uh, to their population related to land use changes, uh, disturbances, forest fires, all kinds of different, uh, different issues. Uh, and of course, a uh, disease like chronic wasting disease could be potentially uh, devastating or limiting to these populations. So there's been a number of research studies that have looked at whether caribou are susceptible to CWD that have demonstrated they in fact are susceptible. Uh, there was a study done by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in 2012 where they orally infected uh, reindeer, uh, which are the same species as caribou with material, infectious material from deer and elk. And they found that they did become infected. They developed symptoms within 20 months. Uh, so very similar to what you'd see in deer. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising given that genetically, caribou and deer have the same uh, identical prion genes. Another study by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, was done in 2015, and they also uh, infected uh, caribou or sorry, reindeer with uh, material from infected elk, uh, mule deer from Wyoming, uh, white-tailed deer from Wisconsin, and those animals went on to develop infection. A majority of those animals went on to develop infection. Um, so those animals were infected through inoculation of the brain. Um, but later, they placed them in pens with perfectly healthy animals that had never been exposed. So they placed the infected animals with uh, healthy reindeer, and unfortunately, the healthy reindeer also became infected. Um, so we have evidence that this disease is transmissible to, uh, to the caribou species um, with similar impacts and clinical disease as we see in our deer populations. Also, uh, since these studies came out, uh, now there's been uh, detection of CWD in, and you may have heard of this in Europe, in, uh, in naturally occurring reindeer uh, populations. So the first detection was in 2016 in a couple reindeer in the Nordfella uh, high alpine region in Norway. Now Norway's uh, reindeer population, the whole population is around 25,000 animals. This herd uh, was over 2,000, about 2,500 animals in this infected herd. And this was the first time CWD was found in the wild outside of North America. Uh, the European government took an aggressive approach and decided to eradicate this entire herd of reindeer, so over 2,500 animals. And they decided to leave this area fallow for five years uh, to see if you know, they could eliminate it and then allow uh, through natural movements allow animals to come into this, this area. Um, so what happened is, uh, unfortunately, they were unable to eradicate the disease. Uh, it's been over five years. They found additional cases in reindeer. There's also been additional cases found in Finland. 
What's interesting is that the strain of CWD in Europe does appear to be different than what we're seeing in North America. Um, so potentially uh, another spontaneous uh, infection that arose, we don't know where it uh, may have originated, but it does appear to be different than what we're seeing in North America. Um, so back to the boreal, uh, boreal species and boreal caribou and, and, and moose here. So this is a, an older map of the CWD distribution, uh, but it highlights um, the potential for CWD uh, introduction into the boreal forest. So uh, you can see on the inset here on the right, you can see a detection of CWD in wild uh, deer and elk uh, in red. Uh, and we have our caribou, caribou range here in yellow and green. Um, so while the caribou population range has retracted over the years, we do see movement of deer up into the boreal forest. So they move back and forth, between, back and forth between the farmland. And so um, this is of course a concern for, for a potential introduction uh, into the boreal forest and something that we're looking closely at. So uh, what we're seeing is the disease has continued and is continuing to spread. It's now endemic across all of Southern Saskatchewan. Uh, it had recently, as of last winter, uh, not this past winter, the year before, been detected uh, in mule deer uh, in Manitoba. Uh, and the Manitoba government has been grappling with this um, and initiated some aggressive hunting strategies to try to uh, reduce their mule deer populations. So we're concerned about the potential risk of establishment and further movement into the boreal forest and the increasing infection rates we're seeing. So I mentioned the South Saskatchewan River Valley, and we know that is an area where we likely have really high environmental contamination. Another um, issue in around uh, CWD that, that comes to mind, that, that comes to a lot of people's mind is, is uh, potential risk for human health. So uh, we get a lot of questions pertaining to this. And as far as we know, the risk of human infection remains low. So there have been no documented cases of CWD in humans. Uh, and of course, we have this disease now for 25 years in Saskatchewan and longer in, in parts of the U.S. Um, it appears under natural conditions, it appears to only be transmitted to members of the deer family. So there's a bit of a, a species barrier there. Um, but there now have been experimental studies in a variety of other species that have shown transmission to ferrets, um, rodents, a variety of different uh, species of monkeys under experimental conditions. So this doesn't mean that it would spread to people, um, but given the concerns related to, to BESC or mad cow disease, uh, as a precaution, Health Canada and World Health Organization recommends that people do not eat animals that are known to be infected. So there's concerns about prion diseases and how that might evolve over time. So, uh, so it's recommended that people do not eat animals that are known to be infected. There's, of course, the social impacts of CWD, so there's also the perception of food safety risk. A few years ago, food banks turned away wild game meat donations because they were concerned over the risks of CWD. Since then, uh, food banks have been testing um, animals before donating the meats donated. Uh, and, of course, Indigenous communities and hunting communities that rely on uh, harvest of food for subsistence across the province, uh, it's, a, it's a major concern to them as well. So there's a number of different uh, considerations with respect to this disease and the reason why, uh, why it's important. Uh, and I mentioned the first and foremost uh, for, for myself as a, a wildlife manager, so the impact and health is on the health and sustainability of our wild uh, cervid populations. Um, and we're starting, as I mentioned, to see those population impacts, including uh, potentially reduced age structures, so fewer older animals. Um, the potential for transmission into the boreal ecosystem and threatened caribou and other boreal species, uh, concerns related to indigenous uh, rice-based hunting, indigenous culture, um, obviously, you know, big, big component of indigenous culture, um, making sure we have these, these populations on the landscape to harvest. Uh, there's growing concerns over food safety, and uh, and we are starting to see impacts on our hunting and tourism as well. Uh, we at least have some anecdotal information. The hunters are choosing not to hunt in some of these really highly infected areas uh, because they're not wanting to harvest infected animals. But one thing that has resonated across stakeholder groups uh, is that doing nothing is not an acceptable option here. So... 
So what are some of the challenges on the landscape and, and what can we do to limit the spread of CWD? So I'll go through some of these challenges that we're seeing here and, and I've highlighted a few. Uh, we do have the issue of um, lots of attractants on the landscape, animals congregating around feed. Uh, we do have infected game farms in the province. There's obviously uh, concerns over habitat loss and how that's impacting deer populations uh, in the province as well. Um, so the issue of attractants, uh, so that could include uh, feed, livestock feed that's put out by farmers. Uh, it could include grain bags, uh, but also bait that's put out by hunters uh, during the hunting season. So all of these are potential sources of congregation. Uh, we've learned through COVID, uh, the idea of social distancing, uh, the same applies uh, to CWD when you have animals congregating in large numbers around feed sources, salivating, defecating, uh, that um, really enhances transmission. So some of these things are really difficult to do anything in, about. They're ingrained in, uh, in either hunting culture or our um, just the nature of, of agriculture, which is so uh, important uh, in here in, in Southern Saskatchewan. Um, but of course, um, you know, these animals are going to find opportunities when there's feed. Uh, they're going to try to congregate. They're going to look for areas where there's shelter. They're going to try to escape predation by congregating as well in some of these areas. So, um, so that's a significant concern. Um, there was a study just to highlight this back in... Um, in 2000, uh, finished in 2012, uh, Dr. Trent Wollinger at the University of Saskatchewan put out camera traps to monitor uh, deer uh, in a highly endemic area, so along South Saskatchewan River Valley and the southern uh, regions, which are more agricultural land, uh, and kind of monitor these sites as a proxy for transmission. So at this time, there was no opportunities uh, to test the soil or test the, the environment. Uh, now that that is something that's uh, become uh, available and, and there's, there's increased opportunities there. But at the time he was looking at uh, the frequency with which these animals use the, the landscape. And what he found was, uh, for instance, you've got a deer here uh, around a spilled grain pile and you can see this animal is clearly emaciated. You can see its ribs. You can see it's kind of got that really, um, you know, depressed posture, uh, looking pretty weak there. So this animal was coming back to the same uh, pile of grain to feed over the course of a week. It was later found dead and confirmed to have CWD. And within days, you can see there were healthy animals that within a week were, were feeding from the exact same site. Uh, so you can see the potential there for transmission uh, through contact with the environment. Um, another question that that comes up a lot is whether or not um, other species might serve as reservoirs of infection. So potentially scavenging species or whether they can transmit the disease. There was one study in domestic swine um, that did show that the animals, so they were infected either orally or through inoculation of the brain with infected material from infected deer. And these pigs actually did develop, see they had CWD prions that were detected in their tissues, so in their brain, in their lymph, lymph, sorry, lymph node tissues. Um, the question is whether or not they could transmit the disease, and that, that's still unknown. So we know that they, they can become infected. Uh, they don't necessarily develop clinical disease, uh, and whether or not they can transmit, uh, that's yet to be determined. So uh, it was an interesting study, raised some interesting questions. You can see uh, highlighted here an article um, from the North Battleford area uh, where a farmer was reporting that, uh, a landowner was reporting that there were a uh, wild boar that were licking minerals at the deer blind uh, and were returning to the same area. You can see the potential uh, for transmission, uh, whether or not it's contact with infected carcasses or uh, infected uh, feed. Uh, in some of these areas. Um, so this is something that's still being investigated. Um, so as far as other species are concerned, we have not seen any CWD in species other than uh, members of the deer family, um, but certainly uh, there are some questions about that. Uh, first carcass movement and disposal is another concern. So hunters naturally are through their normal practices, uh, move carcasses uh, from the site where they harvested the animal to um, often their home location and um, 
and that's that's fairly commonplace. Uh, on the map here, you can see uh, some of the zones in yellow where we have high rates of CWD, and then the blues blue locations are where the hunter addresses are. So where they generally, uh, where their locations are, where they're potentially going back to. So you can see there's potential opportunity from hunters to hunt in south, in the south, in some more of the infected areas, and move up into areas of the province like the Boyle Forest, where uh, where we have not yet detected CWD. Uh, and then there's, of course, the issue of disposal, you know, what happens with the carcass afterwards. Uh, it's something we're working on as far as building uh, opportunity, working with landfills and disposal locations. So hunters have somewhere to, to dispose of their car carcasses instead of them being moved and left out on the landscape. So I'm going to uh, just go through these these last few slides here because I do want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So basically, um, we shifted to a motor control and trying to reduce transmission risk and are looking at a number of different options. So some of these might include things like reducing those attractants on the landscape, so restricting or reducing baiting and feeding, dealing with things like fencing of hay and other uh, other feed sources for wildlife. Uh, restricting movement of high-risk materials like rain and spinal cord, uh, harvest management, uh, which was done in those early years. Uh, it's something that can potentially be an effective tool if, if done at a potentially at a higher rate. So increasing harvest, for instance, on uh, the buck population. So we know bucks are more likely to be infected. We obviously need to take into consideration that Perspectives of stakeholders differ widely on this issue. Uh, obviously, you know, game farmers will have a vested interest in the profits uh, that they uh, they depend on from the game farming industry. Uh, the outfitters uh, rely heavily on baiting and other uh, you know practices to try to sustain their their livelihoods as well. Uh, that's going to be very different than the perspectives of Indigenous people uh, that rely on wildlife for subsistence or uh, farmers that want to protect their crops and their livelihoods as well and, and make sure we're all healthy and fed. So um, so really to kind of integrate this, what we've we've aimed to do is work within this context of one health. And it's this idea that the health of animals, humans, and the environment is interconnected and interdependent. So we know that um, you know, a healthy environment means healthy wildlife and healthy people. How do we do this? We work across the discipline. So we obviously need to work really closely with the Ministry of Agriculture on the game farming side, with the Ministry of Health on the public health side, um, and with all of the different various uh, stakeholders and Indigenous right holders that, uh, that have a vested interest in this. So it's, it's, it's a really, needs to be a really concerted multidisciplinary effort. And I'll just fast forward here to kind of um, just highlight something that we've been working on here. And that's this idea of a zoning approach. So and prioritization of different areas of the province. So as you can imagine, really hard to manage a disease that's so highly endemic in the population. And it's gonna be even harder to manage it in central Western regions of the province where we presume there's a high level of environmental contamination in the soil and the environment. But some of these areas along the Manitoba border in the boreal forest fringe are areas where we might have more opportunity, where there's the rates still are relatively low. And so we might be more successful by implement in implementing some of our management options. So there's also the cost of doing nothing, and certainly we do not want to, uh, to ignore this issue. Uh, so what would happen if we did nothing? Well, we'd likely see population level impacts. We'd see the loss of these older uh, age classes. So impacts on the populations as a whole, uh, potential introduction into vulnerable populations such as the boreal caribou, uh, impacts on indigenous food security, uh, hunting practices, uh, we're already seeing, like I said, impacts on hunting culture in the province, and that seems to be shifting. Uh, and of course, as we see increased environmental contamination, uh, some of these effects are going to be compounded. So, um, and of course, food safety concerns remain really important to a lot of people. So, uh, so there are a lot of costs if we do nothing, and, and we certainly don't want to allow for that. So, I'll just end with this one slide here, uh, taken from some colleagues in the Northwest Territories. It's a picture of some barren ground caribou. Um, but the idea is that we uh, we aim to have an environment uh, that will sustain present and future generations. And so, you know, when it comes to CWD, it's, it's really uh, being in it for the long haul, and it's going to take some time. So with that, I'll end and, and uh, leave some time for questions. 
Awesome. I'm glad you're leaving time for questions because we have lots of them coming in. <laughs> um, first of all, that was a really great presentation. It was really good to kind of see the history about CWD in our province. And um, it's kind of sad, unfortunately, where, what's been happening. So, um, and I'm personally very interested as a deer hunter as well. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to give you a few questions, just sort of rapid fire. We have lots coming in. Um, there's quite a few people wondering about pronghorn. Can pronghorn get CWD? No. No. Nope. So, you okay. know, they're in a different family. They're not in the cervid family. Okay. So. And then what about bison, wild or captive? Same. Yeah, they've done studies uh, on cattle, uh, and they showed they were not able to infect them through natural means. And in fact, on some of the depopulated uh, game farms, they put bison on those those farms. Oh. Uh, so highly infected farms with deer and elk, uh, they've put bison on those farms. Those animals have not become infected. Okay, that's awesome. Um, goats. Same. Yeah. So, yeah. Same as same as the other species. Yeah, they're in a different family, so they do not appear to be susceptible. Okay. And then, what about dogs that are fed um, deer scraps and potentially the deer is contaminated? Right. So there's been some studies uh, in coyotes to look at uh, whether they could become infected. It seems like it just passes through their digestive system. So they can take in the prions uh, in the, the food they consume and they it just comes right out the other end. So they do not appear to be infected. Um, they could potentially spread it through their feces, um, but it's likely not a significant source of, of spread compared to, to the spread we're seeing by the, the deer themselves. Okay. And what about young being born to um, an infected animal? Yes, they can become infected. So there have okay. now been studies where the mother can pass the infection in utero. It doesn't happen every time, and that's still a little bit unclear uh, when it happens, when it doesn't, but it, yes, potentially. And then obviously after they're born, they can become infected through through the you know bodily fluids and contact okay. with people. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and the next one is um, a bit more, a bit longer. So um, can you tell us about the potential CWD vaccine that has been discussed in the news recently? Will the Ministry of Environment uh, be continuing to invest in this vaccine or do you think that it's a good strategy to invest in? Yeah, uh, yes, I can talk to that a little bit. Um, so yes, the ministry is investing uh, money over the next five years to support research into a CWD vaccine. Uh, this is collaborative research across Canada. So there's a number of different universities that are involved. And they're trying to develop a candidate vaccine that can potentially be used uh, in a wildlife setting or in a captive game farming setting uh, to be, you know, to, to limit transmission of CWD infection rates. How likely it is to be effective uh, that's still, you know, to be decided. It's several years out. It's still very much in the experimental phases. So it's 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 too early to tell. Uh, you know, I think everybody would like to have a silver bullet, and so uh, you know, we're not hedging our bets too much. Um, obviously, current management options are very limited. So it, it would be it would be a great a uh, great thing if if that could could be developed, and we're hopeful. But um, but yeah, it's still a long ways out. Okay. Um, and then what about scavenger birds? Could they spread? Has there been any research on ravens, magpies, crows? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There has been uh, some research on ravens. Um, and yes, but they had, they can potentially spread it. Again, they're not really amplifying the, uh, the infection. So they're not becoming infected themselves, um, but they are shedding it in their digestive system, same as the coyotes, and potentially shedding it that way or moving infected, you know, tissue material from one site to another. Okay. Um, do you know if hunt farms are regularly tested for CWD? Yes. So all game farms, any animals on those farms, it's mandatory that they are tested if they die on the farm. So any dead animals will be tested. Okay. And if there is a positive test, what happens? Yeah, so as of, uh, so prior to 2018, the farm was depopulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. As of 2018, that's no longer the case. Uh, it depends on whether they're not, whether or not they're on a federal program called a Voluntary Herd Certification Program. Uh, majority of farms in the province are not on this program, meaning they're not a eligible for federal compensation. So they are able to operate as CWD positive. Those animals will have to go to slaughter. Uh, they can go to a hunt farm. Um, 
but um, yeah, they are able to to essentially, you know, continue their operations as CWD positive with some restrictions on their movement. Okay. Um, thanks for that answer. Um, our next question is from a listener named Julie, and she says, what research is being done on CWD transmission um, to cattle, which would mimic or could be BSE? Um, there's a, a lack of control of huge herds of deer that, that aren't natural that are currently in Saskatchewan. Um, there are herds of 100 to 200 mule deer moving through haystacks continually. Um, could we be setting our ag industry up for absolute disaster of billions of dollars? Yeah, we get that question quite a lot. Um, yeah. So the studies I was alluding to earlier with respect to the bison and cattle, those were done quite a few years ago. Uh, so there were these, you know, this was a question quite a while back. Um, and so there were studies where they did inoculate uh, cattle with CWD material. They were, you know, able to inoculate calves uh, into the brain and the calves did become infected, but that was through an experimental way that's not natural. And then subsequently they've done studies where they've tried to infect them orally, they've put them on infected farms uh, where there's a lot of environmental contamination. And so based on those studies, it looks like right now at this time, they're not susceptible. Okay. You know, whether or not things can, might change in, in mm -hmm. over time as the disease evolves, it's hard to say, but right now it looks like they're not. Okay, that makes sense. Um, if a diseased deer is found in a garden, is it safe to grow vegetables there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I've had that one before. Um, we think that likely the you know the level of contamination from that deer would be, would be very low. Uh, keep in mind that we've had CWD for over twenty five years, and we've had tens of thousands of people that have you know not been testing or consuming infected deer. Um, so so right. You know, it looks like there's there's a very minimal risk or a very low risk of transmission to people. Um, so, you know, likely that would be even lower uh, when you're talking about, you know, contaminated soil or plants. Um, I think, you know, there's there's a need for more research in this area. I think it's interesting that they can be taken up by plants. But um, but as far as the rest, I would be overly concerned. Um, everybody obviously needs to, to, to have their own gauge for what their, their level of risk is that they're willing to accept. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and there's a few questions about immunity or genetic resistance. Do you think that um, this will kind of go away on its own? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's a bit of hopeful thinking. Um, I think in terms of the game farming industry, there's a, there, there, there's a lot of um, interest in, in that, that idea that of genetic resistance. And we do know, so we do know that certain animals are more genetically resistant to CWD. It doesn't mean they don't get it. It means it takes a lot longer for them to develop clinical disease. And so there's already efforts underway in the game farming industry to breed for these more resistant genotypes or animals that are more resistant. Now in the wild, it's a little bit more challenging, right? Because we don't breed wild animals. Uh, they evolve naturally. Um, we know that some of, we've done some studies to look at genotypes, not specifically in Saskatchewan, but in other parts of North America, and they seem to be less prevalent in the population. So less than 20% of the population has these more resistant genotypes, which may mean that maybe they're not as adaptive in the wild in nature as, you know, for, for whatever reasons. Um, so potentially over hundreds of years, um, it's, it's an interesting theory. So we haven't seen evidence of these things. Okay. Um, our next question is from Michael. Um, why does the province still allow baiting and mineral licks for hunting, given the implications for spreading CWD and their overall health of deer populations? Yeah, um, I'd say it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated, but, um, you know, those practices are really firmly ingrained in hunting culture in the province because it, it was permitted from the, from the beginning. So for, for many generations and decades, uh, hunters have been using these practices. So um, to change that would be uh, really challenging as it has been in every other jurisdiction that across North America. Um, there's obviously jurisdictions that do not allow baiting, um, but many of those never allowed baiting. So that's, that's the challenge, right? When you've allowed something for so long and it's, it's something that um, hunters have come to rely on. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we we still have lots of questions, but I see we're at one o'clock. Would it be okay if we keep going a few more minutes? Yes. 
Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I went a little bit long there. So. <laughs> okay. Um, what about the spread from ticks? Can they do anything for like? Do they spread CWD? I, I'm not not to my knowledge. So I am okay. not familiar with any studies of CWD on ticks. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> There's enough going on already. <laughs> um, and Ashley wants to know uh, the studies that show transmission to other um, animal groups. Did any of the positive cases result from oral ingestion or just the intracranial inoculation? Yes. So in the experimental studies, yes, there's been a few cases where it's been oral transmission. So there was a macaque study uh, that was, um, was demonstrated or presented at a conference in 2017. And a few of those animals were infected through oral ingestion of infected uh, meat from infected deer. Uh, and also in the uh, experimental study of the pigs that I mentioned, uh, some of those animals were also orally inoculated. So again, they're, they're eating large amounts of, uh, of highly infectious material in large volumes. So it's not really natural exposure, but uh, yes, they, they, they were through oral ingestion. Okay. Um, so their next question, do you know if the different infection rates for whitetail versus mule deer are due to physiological or behavioral differences or why is there such a difference? Yeah, it's more likely behavioral differences. It's hard to say. Um, and I say that because when you look at different regions, so then also, you know, densities on the landscape as well. So when you look at, uh, you know, the Midwestern United States, where they don't have mule deer and they have high densities, really high densities of white-tailed deer populations, we're seeing very similar rates uh, in white-tailed deer than what we're seeing in mule deer here in, in Saskatchewan. So, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know exactly why they would be different, um, but it probably has to do with, with movements, with their social structures. Um, potentially. Okay. And how many people are doing testing for CWD at the testing facility? So uh, we have two different laboratories we, we use. So we have a CWD processing lab outside of Regina, where we have four technician, permanent, well, technicians from September through January. Uh, so they're ex actually extracting the brain uh, tissue and the lymph node tissues from the deer heads that come in from the hunters. So there's four techs. Uh, and then once those are processed, they get sent to the veterinary diagnostic lab in uh, Saskatoon. So that's Prairie Diagnostic Services. And then they have a, a number of staff, four or five additional staff that process those samples and get them, uh, get them um, you know, ready for, for evaluation. So, uh, so it's quite a few, few people that are working on this, uh, this project. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and are there any planes and plans on how uh, the buffer zone would roll out? Yeah, I think we're still really in the early stages mm -hmm. of planning for that and still needing to refine the boundaries as well. So those boundaries I showed were very conceptual and not yet defined. Um, so a lot of uh, discussions with the Ministry of Agriculture uh, moving forward to try to further sort of refine that. So, so no immediate plans for implementation. And it, it's something we have to work on a little bit more closely with our stakeholders as well. Okay. Um, and a listener named Kurt says, as a deer hunter, should I be concerned about consuming deer meat from southwestern Saskatchewan? I think it's, again, a personal decision. So as I mentioned, the risk of human infection is very low. Um, so, you know, we can't recommend that hunters eat infected animals because the World Health Organization and Health Canada do not recommend that. They, uh, given it's a prion disease, there's some level of concern, potentially, you know, the incubation period could be 40 or 50 years. It's one of the questions um, or, you know, potential for the, for the disease to evolve. So, um, so yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think it's a very low risk, but everyone has to kind of make that decision themselves. And yeah. some people decide, you know, I'm going to, I'm okay eating it myself, but maybe I won't give it to my kids and, and those sort of mm -hmm. that decisions. And what about, um, properly cooking your meat is does that make a difference no it does not so prions are very resistant to heat uh okay. and, and any sort of disinfection so there's it, it wouldn't do anything okay and i think our last question um is about fencing so is there any way the ministry of environment could look in at ways to minimize congregation by providing some sort of funding for keeping wildlife out of haystacks 
Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And yeah, we're certainly looking into it. So um, yeah, we've, you know, we've, we've had a lot of, we get a lot of complaints every year about uh, deer congregating uh, in around haystacks and uh, on, on different um, in farmers fields. And so, yeah, I think it's a great solution and it's something we're definitely looking into and we'll be working with other partners to try to see if we can, can, um, can maybe have some sort of program for, for landowners. That makes sense. Well, I know we're already over time, so I'll leave it here. Um, we didn't make it through all the questions, but if people still have more questions, maybe they can reach out to you directly then, or uh, I know there's lots of resources available on the website. And Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and my email's there and I hope you were able to take it down or you can share it, but uh, yeah, feel free to, to send me any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this really awesome presentation and for all the extra time in answering. <laughs> I think there was about um, 50 questions that came in. It's probably a new oh. record. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. I, it's always a yeah, topic that generates a lot of discussion and, and I really appreciate the opportunity today. Well, thank you very much. Um, to all of our attendees, thank you so much for catching today's webinar. Uh, be sure to catch our next one about Golden Eagles on May. Um, this webinar and our webinars will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel, so you can always rewatch this one if you missed something there too. Um, and when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling that out, we really appreciate it and gives us ideas uh, for topics for the future and we can report back to our funders to keep our Anita Prairie Speaker Series going. So with that, thank you so much everyone everyone and have a great rest of your day. Bye.